Hello, heathens, and welcome to Spinning the Wheel podcast with me, your host, Megan Angus. And this week, we are going to be getting into the thick of it with a little bit of Maybon season, new moon in Libra. And this is Lunar Week 33 by some of our lunar calendars, right? Right. Okay, <sighs> let's get into it. Okay, briefly to orient us on the wheel before we talk about all of the things that we've got going on this week. Um, we are in Maybon season and our witches work during Maybon season centers around harvest, um, health and health uh, processes uh, and healers, purification and um, transition and change because we are of course changing out of uh, our summertime life and our summertime forms into our fall forms and ultimately our winter and underworld journey forms and processes. And on the global level, we are still seeing lots of holidays and festivals centering around abundance, healing, uh, and ancestor worship. Um, the ocean worship is is kind of mellowing out at this point. We still have a few river deities popping up here and there, but ocean worship is sort of starting to take a back step uh, or back seat. All right. This week is a spicy meatball wrapped in ghost pepper slices with a side of hot sauce. So we're not going to have a whole bunch of preamble. We're just going to get into it. This week starts on October 6th with a new moon in Libra at 13 degrees um, and we find that exact at 4 5 a.m pacific standard time later in the day for everybody else so what do we have with a new moon in libra first and foremost before we get into all the other stuff well in our lunar cycle new moons always give us a sand a, a chance to recenter and reground ourselves in ourself and in our reality and in our process there's a lot of stuff in the world right now that is eagerly um, distracting you and decentering you and destabilizing you there's a lot of stressors in the world there's a lot of unknowns a lot of wild stuff going on so there are a lot of reasons that we might not feel super present <laughs> um, we might be thinking about five months ago or two years from now or you know, just not here, right? Not with ourselves, not in the moment. So new moons give us a chance every 30 days, 29 and a half days to be technically accurate, to come back to the self, to come back to like, who am I? What am I doing? <laughs> like, what really matters to me? Let me re get reintroduce myself to myself and get recentered in myself. We get that every 30 days. It's a really cool gift from the universe or a gift from ourselves to ourselves. Um, and our new moons in Libra, in particular, bring us into a conversation with ourselves around our relationships to people um, and our, uh, our decorum, um, how we conduct ourselves in social settings, how we conduct ourselves in society. And that conversation can branch into a bunch of different places. That could be a conversation around how do I present myself literally, as in my clothing, my aesthetics, um, my look, my drip. Um, it might be a, a conversation around um, how do I present myself in terms of my character? Um, you know, am I jovial? Am I flirtatious? Like, what's that conversation? But it also brings in some deeper stuff, right? It can also be an ethical conversation of how am I conducting myself in society? How am I conducting myself in my social circles, in my community? Um, and what are the ethical choices I'm making here? What are the moral uh, you know, quandaries that I'm faced with when, when various situations um, arise? So all of that stuff can come up for us when we are moving through Libra. Um, but coming back to the relationship piece, Libra in particular oversees committed relationships and committed partnerships, partnerships that might have some kind of a contract involved. Literally, maybe a paper contract, a lease would be a relationship that falls under this or partners in a business. But 
unspoken or un not physical contracts can also come under this purview. So, um, you know, relationships that have contracts about them or commitment of some kind. These can be sexual relationships, they could be romantic relationships, um, they could be domestic partner relationships, our deep friendships can come into this conversation as well. Anybody that we feel committed to and that there is like a contract or an understanding about that commitment. So sometimes these new moons can be a place, especially <laughs> given that we have um, a Mercury retrograde happening in the background while this is going on. Um, this could be a, I thought we were in this kind of a relationship and the other partner or partners are saying, well, my understanding was we are in this kind of relationship. So you might find yourself having a variety of those types of conversations over the course of this month, especially this week with the rest of the astrology that we have. Um, you might be having conversations with yourself about how do you conduct yourself in your society, in your community? Um, what kind of impressions would you like to be giving? What kind of impression do you think you're giving? Um, and, and what does that all add up for, um, for you? But coming back to that ethics thing, <laughs> um, the new moon in Libra for us as individuals can sometimes really stir up a conversation around ideals and morals and um, our ethical beliefs, right? And our beliefs about our ethics. <laughs> and that can get super spicy <laughs> because uh, we've got a lot of wild things going on in the world right now. And um, there are a lot of really tough but extremely necessary conversations that are sort of being handed to people. A lot of folks are not voluntarily saying, hey, I'd like to have a conversation about my racist bias. Uh, but society is saying, you need to have a conversation with yourself about your racist bias. Um, that's exactly the kind of stuff that is appropriate and necessary for us to address on a new moon in Libra. Let me start at the start of a real conversation, a new depth of conversation with myself about how I conduct myself in my society. It's, Libra is an air sign. So it is absolutely about how I'm thinking, how I'm communicating, the literal words that I'm using. So that whole profound conversation with self of, does my vocabulary need an update? And the fact that I care about that or don't care about that implies a bunch of deeper stuff. And how much of that do I need to be dealing with right now? All of that. Okay. So when we are dealing with um, the new moon in Libra, we want to be examining our ideals. Are they still serviceable and proven? Are we holding on to really naive ideals, <laughs> um, but we don't really believe in them anymore. We're just like, wouldn't it be great if this thing happened? And yet we also know that that's not probably realistic for our lifetime. Um, and so we're holding on to the naive want versus <laughs> accepting the, the work of the actual reality that's in front of us. Um, do we actually hold to our ideals? Do we hold ourselves to our ideals? Um, or have we become so disillusioned that we have given up on our ideals? And hey, if you feel like that sentence is true for you, I don't blame you. So let me first say that. And also, hope. <laughs> it's a real thing. Um, and sometimes we have to stir it up in each other. That's a conversation for later, though. Okay. So, um, you know, we are keenly aware of injustice on this new moon, and it can be extremely infuriating. And I want to um, draw note to that because, again, we have some spicy astrology this week that is really encouraging us to get into a fight, get into an argument, get 
freaked out about stuff, get worked up about stuff. And again, this new moon in Libra, we are acutely aware of the injustices in our own life, the injustices in our community, the injustices that our friends and our neighbors um, and community members are being subjected to, and it infuriates us. We are really, we can be very sensitive to that on this moon. But because it's Libra <laughs> and there is this thing about presentation and aesthetics, um, we may default to um, trying to relieve the tension of that, you know, fury that we're feeling um, by just trying to get everybody to get along and be on the same page rather than dealing with the actual problem, the actual source of friction or infuriation. Um, infuriation. That's a word now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's where, you know, some of the funky stuff can come in with some of the other astrology with this Mercury and retrograde that's all hanging out in the background is rather than actually getting down to the uncomfortable, ooky, spooky part of the thing, we kind of veer a hard right right at the last second you know and we're like nope not getting into that let's just talk about how you're using really violent language right now as you're talking about your oppression i'm feeling oppressed by you talking about your oppression that thing right like it just be you know i understand that you don't want to be shot by the police but could you say please could you just say it nicer that is the funky side of new moon and libra straight up so witness that in yourself Witness where you default to that place because you probably do it some of the time. I know I do um, because I want to avoid the work too. <laughs> We're all here together trying to avoid the hard spots, right? And, you know, so much of what is happening in our life and in our world right now is like, we can't avoid the hard spots any longer. Too many generations have avoided the hard spots. They are now everything is the hard spot. So <laughs> there's no avoiding it. There's just getting through it. Um, and with the least amount of damage to ourselves and our loved ones, right? Um, and so this is one of those moons that's saying, hey, we could default to the passive aggressive route through this conversation one more time. And, or we could pull the whole car over and go, look, I know that this isn't cute, but it has to be said. Um, and you might be saying that to yourself. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, ways that you can work with this energy is all of that that I've just said. Um, but uh, also another way that you could work with this is um, to list three causes that affect your community that you care about and why you care about them. And I want to stress three causes that are in your community. So don't just say homelessness, say homelessness in my neighborhood, in my city. Um, climate change, climate change as it is affecting the watershed near my house, as it is affecting the air quality in my neighborhood, right? Like some, you, like your neighborhood, your community, your spot. List three causes that affect your community that you care about and why you care about them. And then I want you to pick one and I want you to write out a list of actions that you can take to address this and do it. And I want you to absolutely do research on this because as I'm telling you this, write down a list of stuff you could do. You're probably thinking, well, I don't know what I could do do research on it, find out what's going on with that issue in your community. And you'll see exactly what it is that you're supposed to be doing. You'll be told, oh, we're having a meeting on this day. Oh, we're trying to get the city council members to be aware of this problem. Oh, we've got a boycott going on with, you know, this company. It, the actions will be there. Um, and all you need to do is join in. And it's something that's in your community that affects you and your neighbors. You should be invested. <laughs> um, okay. So um, that is my recommendation for this new moon in Libra. Um, be aware <laughs> that there is some social tension. Be aware that there is some exa self-examining stuff going on here around our ethics, our values, why we do what we do, um, why we 
act the way we act, all that stuff. Um, and that there's going to be a few stressors this week really poking at that for us. Um, so be kind and loving with yourself and patient with yourself as we move into this. Okay. All right. For our lunar body with our new moon in Libra, we are awakening, activating, adorning, stimulating, and nourishing for action our hips, our kidneys, and our bladder. As I say every week, I am not a medical doctor. I am a doctor of love uh, and, and magic, really, at this point. Um, not so much love anymore. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't know a damn thing about medical health. So please uh, get with your trusted medical advisor if you are wanting to incorporate any of the information from this podcast into your physical body magical practices. Um, for our plant body work that we are doing with the Newman and Libra, nothing. Don't touch them. No pruning, no trimming, no planting, no transplanting, nothing, none of that stuff. But aesthetics, absolutely. Wipe down your pots, maybe bring some new decorations around your plants, maybe give them a spin so that they are more aesthetically pleasing in some way, give them a little space if they've been growing, maybe add some twinkle lights, you know, that kind of thing. Keep it cute. All right, outside of our new moon in Libra, we have a little tiny bit of astrology happening on this day. It's just hardly a thing at all. I wasn't even going to mention it, but you know, we're here. So everybody stay calm. Pluto is stationing direct at 24 degrees of Capricorn, 11.28 a.m. October 6th, Pacific Standard Time, later in the day for everybody else around the planet. Okay, so everybody calm, stay calm. Uh, first and foremost, Pluto has been retrograde since April 27th, so it literally spends about six months out of every year in retrograde. So the retrograde versus direct thing may or may not actually be a big deal. <laughs> but the days that the planet changes direction, those are kind of a big deal. So if you have something on or near 24 degrees of Capricorn or Aries or Cancer or Libra, uh, this might be a particularly spicy transit for you. What else is super fun about Pluto is that it tends to hang out at the same degree or two degrees for about a year at a time. So if you have something at or near 24 degrees, it's been dealing with Pluto for some amount of time and is going to be dealing with Pluto for some amount of time. So, you know, pack a lunch, get comfy, right? <laughs> That's what's up when we're dealing with Pluto stuff. But also important to remember, because a lot of the terminology that we use when we deal with Pluto astrologically is super heavy. It's super intense, um, has a lot of gravitas. And yet we're talking about cycles that literally take years, sometimes decades to completely play out. So we're, we're not going to have an apocalypse every day. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> I mean, in normal in normal situations, we we wouldn't be having an apocalypse every day. But as it turns out, you know, Pluto is in a pretty wild place and is making a lot of aspects to other stuff. And you know, hey, look around the world. So you know, maybe maybe it is all right. So we rise to the occasion. That's what's going on. So let's talk about what can be difficult with a Pluto stationing, like whether it's stationing retrograde or like it's stationing direct this time. What kind of stuff? What are the words that we're so scared to say? What is it that's so spooky about Pluto? Well, we're dealing with stuff like really intense jealousy, um, power issues, power dynamics, possessiveness, depression, um, discovering secrets, like real funky information bubbling up to the surface, uh, nefarious moves and nefarious behaviors. And just to top it off and keep it super fun, weird sex stuff and weird sexuality stuff. Because uh, Pluto connected to Scorpio rules the genitals, rules the waist organs. So that's the kind of stuff that can come up for us when Pluto 
is changing directions and is aspecting something specifically in our chart. And again, we want to take that with a grain of salt and use a bit of moderation when we're talking about this stuff because Pluto is dealing with um, transformative processes that literally take years, if not decades, to completely play out. But on those individual days where Pluto is changing direction, what otherwise might be just a quiet hum in the background might become a very loud bang or a loud roar or a loud crashing on those days. So October 6th, Pluto stationing direct. So yeah, we, <laughs> that's what's up. <clears throat> and it really kind of has a like echoing ringing, ringing bell kind of effect over the course of the week because some of the other planets that are doing stuff this week are also still interacting with Pluto. And also uh, we have several days where the moon is moving through Scorpio this week. So there's a pretty big emphasis around these sort of darker shadowy conversations. Um, and again, just like with this new moon in Libra, there is a time where we have to kind of wrangle ourselves and say, it's time for me to go into the dark. It's time for me to go into the spooky. It's time for me to go deal with my shadow elements, my unspoken elements, my hidden elements, um, and, and see what's here. We want to do that in ways that are healthy. We want to do that in ways that um, don't harm ourselves, right? Don't harm the people around us. So of course, I'm going to totally encourage you to go talk with a therapist this week if you need to. Um, you know, talk with trusted friends, absolutely. But those conversations, well, we'll get into that when we get into the moon in Scorpio. But the conversations with friends can be extremely healing this week. And also, it might be really good to have somebody who is not connected to your situation be able to listen to you and let you say some things from out of the darkness, that type of stuff. So, you know, just, just pay attention to it. It might not be anything that actually plays out in your personal life and you might see it on the public stage like, oh, I don't know, you know, the Pandora Papers being <laughs> released and discovering, you know, all of this information about these offshore tax accounts um, or your social media the <laughs> platform may just absolutely shit the bed <laughs> and, you know, right after a whole bunch of super gnarly secrets are revealed about that group, right? So here's the astrology in action. There's our Pluto situation. There's our Mercury retrograde situation, all of that stuff. Okay, so that's a lot of the heavy, but it's not all of it. Um, let's get into the holy days of October 6th and then let's get into the rest of the week. All right, holy days of October 6th, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Al-Gharab, which means the crow, and it is in the crow constellation, and that's, uh, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> it's part of the crow constellation. Enjoy. Okay, uh, from October 6th to the 10th, we have the Draconids meteor showers. Um, this year, the meteor showers will be peaking October 7th and 8th, uh, which is fantastic because we have a new moon. And so the skies will be very, very dark for going out and um, checking out that meteor shower. Uh, they radiate out from Draconis or Dragon uh, constellation, specifically around the star um, El Tannen or Rastaban or Examin. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Also on this day, we have the day of Virgin of Sapopan from Mexico. And this is actually an image of the Virgin Mary. Uh, there are all, a lot of images of the Virgin Mary venerated at this time of year. It's interesting. This image has been credited with a number of miracles and has been recognized by popes. The name Zapopan means among the sapote trees. However, this uh, village, the city where the, the Virgin Mary, excuse me, the, the Virgin of Zapopan is found, um, used to be called Corn Village. 
And there were many small shrines called queues built there mostly to worship the sun. But the primary deity was a god child that was a corn god or a corn goddess. I have read in one source that it was just a boy. I read in another source that it was a, a brother and sister or a boy and a girl that were the corn deities. But hello, corn harvest. We've had a lot of corn symbolism uh, happening at this time of year. So here's another connection to that. Also on this day from our our Hindu friends, we have Mahalaya Amavasya, for, uh, and this is um, the day before the multi-day festival Navratri begins. Um, this holiday is also called Bathukama, and really it's like a floral holiday uh, where these beautiful flowers are stacked. Um, they're out in the courtyard or in the house, um, and they're arranged with different seasonal flowers that have medicinal values in seven concentric layers, uh, kind of in the shape of a temple, like a big heap. Um, and the word Bathukama means mother goddess come alive. Uh, and so this day is um, dedicated to Gauri Devi. It's also dedicated to uh, Par the goddess Parvati, um, asking for her blessings for the harvest that has just come in and income that she's going to help generate uh, for the current year and to ask also for her blessing for the next year. Also on this day, we get into from our Roman ancestors, the sacrifices for the Dies Natalis of the Temple of Feeds or Fides or Fides, Fides. Um, the Dies Natalis is the birthday of a temple. Again, as we, we've talked about in past episodes, the birthday might mean the first stone that was laid for the temple or the last stone that was laid for the temple or when they finally dedicated the temple to the deity, but it's, but it's the birthday for the building itself. Um, and usually there's a variety of uh, celebrations that happen that are pretty, um, uh, universal amongst all of the Dies Natalises of all of the different temples. There's a kind of a cleaning out of the temple, a resetting of things, all of that good stuff. Very new moon energy, right? Um, so Fides or Fides is uh, the goddess of trust. And like where we say the word bona fide or fidelity, that is all coming from this goddess. She was one of the original virtues to be considered an actual religious divinity. Um, Fides or Fides is everything that is required for honor and credibility from fidelity to, in marriage to contractual arrangements and the obligation soldiers owed to Rome. So again, here, uh, an emphasis on this same day around contractual arrangements, fidelity in marriage, fidelity in partnerships, right? Interesting stuff. <laughs> I'm sure it's just a coincidence, as we like to say here on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, Fides also means reliability. So reliability between two parties, which is always reciprocal, a bedrock of relations between people and their communities. Um, and then it was turned into a Roman deity. And from that, we gain the word fidelity. So birthday of that goddess's temple also on this day, October 6th. And this is also the start of the Roman month calendar October. Um, I have been not mentioning that in past episodes and uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll try to remember going forward to mention when the actual months are starting. I thought it was just obvious because it was the new moon, but it's totally not obvious because... It, it's not obvious. So, <laughs> all right, let's move on to October 7th. October 7th, our moon enters Scorpio. Okay. So if it wasn't already spooky, let's get spooky. -er. <laughs> um, and this waxing practically new, but definitely a crescent, um, moon in Scorpio really is encouraging us to look into our own dark heart and understand what lies there. And again, as I said previously, I'm going to say it again, and I'll probably say it again uh, in the episode later, um, talk to somebody, talk to someone, um, talk to a therapist, talk to trusted friends, absolutely, but also talk to somebody who is not connected to your life who's unbiased, um, who can be an objective sounding board for you. Because 
a lot of funky stuff may come up that's true and is maybe too much for your people to handle. And that's real. That's just being real, right? Um, and some funky stuff might come up that's not true. That's paranoia. That is the product of anxiety. That is the product of, um, you know, profound and prolonged frustration, but is not actually what's really happening. And a therapist or a trained counselor, those types of folks, can be an objective sounding board for you to say that stuff out loud. They're not going to get hurt by it because you're not talking about them, right? They're unrelated to you. And then you get to say it out loud and go, wait a minute, what did I just say? Do I really mean that? <laughs> like, that seems a bit extreme. Is that really what's happening or am I exaggerating things? Am I, am I speaking from a place of fear right now? Am I speaking from a place of anger or paranoia and I'm saying something that's out of touch from reality? But also, maybe you have some real beef. Maybe you have some real issues with your friends. A therapist, a trained counselor can also be that sounding board for you that's, again, unconnected to your social circle, unconnected to your friends and family, and you can just say what you need to say and get it off your chest. All of that being said, um, this moon is really, really encouraging us to snuggle up with our own personal funky stuff. You know what your funky stuff is. I don't need to name it. <laughs> um, but it's very Plutonian, right? We already have just within 24 hours ago, uh, Pluto stationing direct. And here now we have the moon entering Scorpio saying, nope, we're going to continue with this spooky underworld, underbelly stuff. We are lifting up our own rocks and seeing what of our own worms are crawling out. Um, this Plutonian work to uncover, this is Plutonian work, excuse me, to uncover our secrets, our fears, our angers, and not just uncover them and be like, oh, wow, I'm screwed up. <laughs> We're all screwed up, side note, TLDR. Um, but it is to ultimately learn how we might integrate this force into our lives. And we're going to do that through self-knowledge and self-control. And also learning about how different another person's darkness can be. And so this is what I started to talk about just a little bit ago with the Libra moon, and I wanted to save it for now. Comparing notes about suffering with friends and confidants can actually be really healthy right now. This is not a competition. It's not a suffer Olympics. That's not what's happening. It's an opportunity to relate to each other through our suffering. I have had a terrible year. It looked like this, blah, 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 blah for me. What about you? I also had a terrible year. I didn't have to deal with any of that stuff, but I did have to deal with this, blah, 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 blah. And what this ultimately does is, you know, reminds us that we all experience pain and stress regardless of who we are. Um, but as Raven Caldera says in Moon Phase Astrology, it is about really cultivating appreciation of our differences and compassion for our similarities through the study of darkness and through the study of the shadow and pain. Spooky stuff, but really extremely healing and connective stuff, right? It's definitely an everybody poops moment, <laughs> but it's also very much a, like everybody cries, everybody hurts, you know, <laughs> get in to put on the REM, let's go. Um, and it's a good reminder because sorrow and fear paranoia, anger, frustration, anxiety alienates us. That's one of the chemical responses that we have as a biological being is we go, oh, I got to hunker down. I got to protect my stuff. You, you're an enemy. Back away. Rawr, rawr, rawr. And we get real defensive about stuff and we get real freaked out. And we get real freaked out. We get real defensive. We get defensive. We get freaked out. Right? So this is a really important moment to remind ourselves, oh, right, we are all 
going through this. I am not the one going through the pandemic. We are going through the pandemic. And I have had to deal with these types of issues. And it's freaked me out in the following ways. You didn't have to deal with any of that, but you did have to deal with these issues. And it freaked you out in the following ways. And remembering to come back together as a family. We're a family that's hurting right now, but we are a family. Even if we are a family in suffering, we're family right now. Um, and that is something that the Western world does not want you to remember. You are supposed to be uh, an exceptionally rugged individual forging a path, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know, have to buy a whole bunch of stuff to make that work too, by the way. Um, the Western world doesn't want us to remember that the most important thing that we have is each other. <laughs> uh, the Western world wants us to believe that if I buy this car or if I finally get that pair of jeans or if I can only afford the, the tattoo or the whatever, that I'll finally be complete. I'll finally, I'll finally be happy right? I'll finally be at peace. When in fact, those things draw us further away from the stuff that will bring us true happiness and true peace, which is in each other and our connectivity and our relationships to each other. Just that stuff. So while we have this waxing moon in Scorpio, for our lunar body, we are activating, awakening, adorning, stimulating, and nourishing for action our sex organs, our pleasure organs, and our waste organs. So if you are a person who enjoys, you know, a nice enema every now and then, maybe go in on the fancy one this time. I know somebody out there was just like, oh my God, she just said enema. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's a normal thing in a lot of people's lives. And that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about here when the moon is in Scorpio. And we're doing Pluto Plutonian stuff. It's like the spooky underworld. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really beautiful moon in and of itself for going into some spooky dark places with your sex, going into some spooky dark places with your body fluids and your body waste and all that stuff. And I, I'm sure somebody out there is like, what is she talking about? But, um, but truly it is to the extent that feels safe and healthy and right for you. And I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> because I think I've already said too much. Okay, for our plant body work that we're doing with the waxing moon in Scorpio, we are planting, transplanting, or grafting for above ground support for those plants. Okay. All right, also on this day, our astrology of this day, we have two things going on. We have one, Venus entering Sagittarius. So Venus is finally getting out of the spooky town of Scorpio and heading into the much more ridiculous sign of Sagittarius. Um, and so our Venusian qualities and tendencies are probably going to become a bit more bouncy, a bit more fun, rather than having these very like intense exchanges. It's a lot more of like in love with the world kind of a vibe. Um, but what can be really interesting <laughs> about Venus being in Sagittarius is Sagittarius is very blunt, very dedicated to the truth and, you know, very on that, like, aren't we all on the same page? It's fine if I say this, right? And so Venus might go from being very subtle and incorporating a lot of subterfuge in our flirtations or the way that we might be moving in terms of romance or whatever to being extremely blunt, being very, very straightforward. Um, you know, there's no, there's no subtlety to this <laughs> whatsoever. Um, you know, again, Venus is really looking for the truth is looking for a higher love. Whoa. Okay. Also on this day, <laughs> we have the sun conjunct Mars in Libra at 15 degrees. We just had a new moon here, and now we have the sun conjunct Mars. This is a lot for Libra. This is a lot for our Libra placements. <laughs> okay, so what's awesome about this is uh, this is a fantastic transition or, um, for uh, summoning really potent amounts of energy for starting a new project, but only if you can work on it by yourself. This is a fantastic day for stuff that requires us to be very vigorous, that requires a high level of physical energy, 
This is not a super great day for mentally exhausting work. Physically exhausting work, yes. Mentally, no. And again, with Mercury in retrograde, this is not a super fantastic time to be trying to pull out the brainification and what have you. Um, but it is important that you can identify with whatever it is that you're doing today. So you really need to want to do it. <laughs> you're like, yes, this needs to get done and I'm excited to do it and let's go for it. So what can be difficult about this conjunction is that our ego energies are on super maximum high on this day. We might be dealing with somebody who's very egoic. It might be us who is expressing that. We might really feel like we need some recognition from our friends or our family. And so anything that we can do to stay occupied, <laughs> or we might be super irritable with our loved ones. Um, other people might be getting really annoyed with you and you might be getting in trouble with people in authority positions if you can't stop running your mouth. Um, think of this transit as kind of a litmus test as to like how satisfied you are with your life. Because if you're not, you are probably going to feel or you might feel irritated by every last little thing under the sun. Disassociate in a healthy way, as we love to do here on the podcast, right? And kind of step back and look at yourself and go, oh, wow, I'm really tripping on this and this and this. These are clearly things that are not bringing me satisfaction, that are bringing me a lot of frustration. Why are they in my life? What What's up with that? And it might be because we really care. It's very important to us. And it's also frustrating. Okay, so then what can we do about that? Um you know, or it might be, I'm allowing this thing that's frustrating to stay in my life because I don't want to rock the boat because I don't want to have that conversation. And so then this transit might be like, yeah, well, but this is like not working. So <laughs> we got to do something about it. If, if any, if you remember anything from this, watch out for arguing on this day, watch out for arguing with yourself, arguing with other people, that kind of thing. There's a lot of opportunities for arguing this week. Again, Mercury retrograde in the background. So we already have the, the the whole groundwork laid for misunderstandings and miscommunications and misinformation. Um, and now this sun conjunct Mars is like, cool, and I'm fired up and ready to argue about it. All right, let's go. Okay, now let's get into the holy days of October 7th. Okay, on October 7th, we have a boatload of holy days. Hello. But possibly the biggest one uh, is... Navratri starts for our Hindu friends all over the planet. This is a, a festival that spans nine nights and ten days and is celebrated every year in the autumn. It is observed in a bunch of different ways and for different reasons throughout India and throughout Hindu cultures across the planet, I should say. Um, but and so theoretically, there are four seasons to the Hindu concept of the year. Um, and so technically, there are four seasonal Navratri. However, this Navratri, the Sharada Navratri um, that is observed here um, at autumn is the biggest one. It is considered to be dedicated to um, the goddess Durga, as well as the goddess Kali, and it is ultimately the triumph of good, Durga, over evil. Um, I don't remember the name of the demon. Um, oh, Mahishasur. Mahishasur. It's a demon. A demon. I shouldn't say his name correctly anyways. Um, but ultimately, Durga battles this demon and eventually conquers them. And so this whole festival celebrates the triumph of light over dark. And yes, it is held here at autumn on purpose because we are about to go into the dark half of the year. And so it's sort of an, an assertion that even as we are going through the dark half of the year, good will triumph over evil. The protective abundance uh, goddesses will still be with us to help us through stuff. And Kali, as a destroyer goddess, is here to destroy anything that might be in our way or trying to stop us or trying to hurt us in any way. We are going to talk more about this festival in this episode and probably others because Navratri is a big deal. 
Also happening on this day for Tiwa Native Americans, we have the deer dance. There isn't a whole lot of information out there, and that's okay. But this is ultimately a dance that involves drums and dancing. Um, there is cornmeal scattered on the ground, and uh, the deer people are called back from the woods. And it is ultimately to celebrate successful hunts as we move into wintertime and our vegetables and fruits and nuts and stuff have stopped growing. And we are relying on hunting as our means of food survival. Also on this day, we have from our Sumerian ancestors, the Feast of Bao, the Sky Goddess. Um, Bao was kind of the city goddess of a few different Sumerian cities. And she also was regarded as a goddess of abundance and was depicted with a vase of flowing streams. Um, her connection to kings extended to a cult of deceased rulers. And she was also regarded as a divine mediator or the queen who decides the destiny of people. She's related to dogs and snakes. Um, we've had plenty of snake imagery at this time of year, so no surprise there. But I love that she's also regarded as the divine mediator. And we have had a lot of divine mediator uh, symbolism all through Virgo season and into the very beginning of Libra season. So here, all the way back to the Sumerians, is that connection. Now we run into a kind of funny clump of Roman holidays. We have the festival for Bacchus. We have the Dionysiad, which is the wine festival from Romania, but basically the same thing as the festival for Bacchus, Dionysus. We also have Mania from our Roman ancestors, and we have a holiday called Mimnescia from our Roman ancestors slash our modern pagan friends. So let's get into it. These festivals for Bacchus or Dionysus are all about the grape harvest and the wine that is going to be produced from that grape uh, harvest. So Dionysus, absolutely, and Bacchus, absolutely, green men type figures are um, vegetation archetypes and they are witnessed now as the ripened fruit on the vine that is being harvested and turned into the wine um a lot of a lot of christian imagery borrowed here <laughs> or you know christians borrowing imagery from this thing uh you know the vine the leaf all of that good stuff okay um so in conjunction with that, we also have this very interesting Mimnescia, okay? This is a day of remembrance. This commemorates Rome's suppression of the Bacchanalia in 186 uh, BCE. So this was actually a solemn, mournful event commemorating the victims of this tragedy, as well as all who have chosen death over the body a death of the body over death of the spirit. So very interesting that we do have records of Rome celebrating the Bacchanal, Festival for Bacchus, the Dionysiad, Festival for Dionysus. And we also have record of Rome suppressing that celebration as well. So that then brings us to the Roman mania that's happening on this day. Um, mania or mania was a goddess of the dead. She, along with Mantis, ruled the underworld. She was said to be the mother of ghosts, the undead, and other spirits of the night, as well as the lairs and the manes. Her name links to the manes, Mana Gentina, or excuse me, Janita, and Manius. Both the Greek and Latin mania derive from men, aka to think. And that connects us to minos, mind or thought, and manu or spirit. In Roman and Etruscan mythology, Mania or Mania is the goddess of spirits and chaos. In Greek mythology, she is the goddess of insanity and madness. And so I think it's very interesting that we have in the Roman myth here, or the Roman version of this holiday, looking at mania or mania as this goddess of the dead, but also a goddess of insanity and madness. And her holiday is on the same day as these holidays celebrating drunkenness and wine. So there's the connection there, right? But then also death, you'll die. And we even have record of Rome 
trying to suppress these holidays on the same day. So I was just when reading through all of this, I was like, ha ha, here goes Rome again, trying to <laughs> trying to control everything. I'm like, no, 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 don't do it like that. Do it like this. This whole mania thing, though, is going to come into play here in just another couple of days with um, some other holy days that are coming up. All right. Also on this day, we have the beginning of the Greek month, Pianepsion. Like I said, I've been forgetting to list these, and I apologize. Uh, pine, 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 pianepsion, Greek month. Okay, let's move on to October 8th. All right, that brings us to October 8th, and thankfully, there's not a lot happening other than just the holy days, so <laughs> let's get into it. Our waxing moon is still in Scorpio, so we are still doing our spooky, bloody, <laughs> funkadelic Scorpio work. Um, we have no astrology to speak of on October 8th. Hooray! So let's just get directly into the holy days. All right. Running from October 8th to October 10th, we have the Wimakwari Festival in Mexico. And this is celebrating the Ojo de Dios, which means the eye of God. The eye was an ancient symbol dedicated to the goddess interestingly enough, and used as a blessing and a protection. The Ojo de Dios, or the Eyes of God, is an ancient symbol made by the Huichol Indians of Mexico and the Aymara Indians of Bolivia. In Mexico, the central eye is made when the child is born, and each year a bit of yarn is added until the child turns five. Um, so obviously it's a protection over babies being born at this time. Um, uh, in Bolivia, they are placed on altars so that God can see and protect people. When you make an Ojo de Dios, you express a prayer in which divine protection is manifested. And protection deities is a big thing at this time of year. Uh, you can make it for yourself or for anyone else. And when giving the Ojo de Dios to someone, you say, may the eye of God be blessing you and protecting you. Also on this day, we have the Squash Festival from our Iroquois friends and ancestors. This is a harvest Thanksgiving, basically. This is a ceremony that lasts three days. There is dancing and uh, drumming and tobacco and gift giving and um, some folks step up to speak and tell stories and um, there is a celebration of the wild blackberry and that is used as medicine during this dance. And then the peach stone game is played, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a really beautiful festival and it's part of the three sisters festival of corn and bean and squash all growing together and um, being harvested throughout the fall season. Also on this day, we have from our Catholic friends, Our Lady of Good Remedy Day of or Festival 4. Um, and this is literally Mary of the Desperate Cases in Need of Cash. So light a candle to my good girl, the Lady of Good Remedy, because I think we all could use a little tiny bit more financial support or maybe a whole lot more financial support. <laughs> this, is, this is the version of Mary that we want to go to for assistance with that issue. Also on this day, we have the Feast of St. Demetrius from our Catholic friends. And TLDR, Demetrius, the name means servant of Demeter. Yes, the Earth Mother, the Mother Goddess who oversees production of grain and crops and also gives birth just happens to be the goddess that this saint is named after. Um, there's all kinds of interesting things about this saint, but really the, th the most important thing, in my opinion, is that his name means devoted to goddess Demeter. <laughs> um, this saint is seen as a patron of agriculture and peasants and shepherds. What a coincidence. Who even could have thought of that except everyone? So, <laughs> um, after the demise of the Eleusinian Mysteries, Demeter's cult in the 4th century, the Greek rural population had gradually transferred her rights and roles onto this Christian saint. Um, all right. And uh, last, but, oh yeah, there, there, I do want to mention this. Um, his, he, there were no relics for this guy for a long time. And then suddenly there were, which is a thing that happened with a lot of saints. <laughs> and, um, 
And so suddenly there's relics and then people were like, okay, I guess put them in this glass box over here. And people were publicly dismissive of their authenticity. Fair. Um, but then the relics were assumed to be genuine after they started emitting a liquid and strong scented myrrh. Um, and so one of his epithets is Miro blight, which means to bleed myrrh or to express or, 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 bleed out myrrh basically myrrh of course being one of the resins that we work with in a wide variety of magics to invoke goddess energy um yin energy lunar energy of course we have the grand combination of frankincense and myrrh right hello come on guys you're too obvious it's too obvious it's too easy all right also on this day just a tiny little old holiday called Lesbian Day. Lesbian Day! What up, girl? Ha <laughs> um, ha! Sorry. This is a global holiday. It's an annual holiday celebrating lesbian culture. And it originated in New Zealand and Australia, but it is now celebrated internationally. And also, yes, there is a Lesbian Visibility Day in April as well. Of course, October, the entire month of October, is coming out month. So... Let's move on to October 9th. All right, October 9th. And that brings us to a waxing crescent moon in Sagittarius at one degree at 1108 a.m. Pacific Standard Time later in the day for everybody else around the planet. What do we have with a waxing crescent moon in Sagittarius? Well, first off, let's talk about the waxing crescent. That brings us to um, the next stage of our lunar process. So stage one, that's our new moon. That's the seed kind of given to us by the universe here. Go figure it out to have a new process. Now we're coming into the next phase. And at the waxing crescent, um, there is a lot of similarity with some of the vibes that we experience during the balsamic moon, which is the last phase of the moon before the new moon. At this waxing crescent, we can get really pulled on by the past and the, the conditions that we have been in. And so we kind of have to make a bit of a decision of like, am I gonna do this or am I gonna just stay with how things are? So there can be a little tiny bit of friction with this moon, more so in the next phase, but it's not bad friction. It's just friction, you know, that's how you get a fire started, right? With friction. So a little bit of friction is like, hey, is there something that needs adjustment here? Is there something that needs to grow or change or move? Well, then we need to address that. Let's make a plan. Let's talk about it. When we're dealing with the waxing crescent moon in Sagittarius, it's specifically drawing our attention to our need to travel and explore to ultimately expand our understanding of our world around us in whatever ways that we can. We're still dealing with a pandemic, people. Just because we're over it doesn't mean it's over us, right? Um, it's the ex that would never leave. So uh, <clears throat> if you know, you know. But um just because we're sick of the pandemic doesn't mean that the pandemic is done. And traveling may not be realistic for you because of health concerns. Traveling might not be realistic for you because of money concerns, right? Not a lot of us have been making a whole lot of money over the last year and a half. Some people have been doing okay, but a lot of us are not. So this might be a moon of dreaming about where you would want to go. Um, with a moon in Sag, there is always an emphasis for some kind of travel slash some kind of an expansion of our understanding of our reality. But a lot of the Sag moons are very like wanderer spirit kind of a vibe. Just like, let's go out for an adventure and see where it takes us and, and you know, just enjoy the, the spontaneity of it. In this waxing crescent, we want to be purposeful about it. So if we're traveling or maybe we're just making plans to travel, remember Mercury is in retrograde, don't buy any plane tickets right now, just get out a journal and sketch some things. Travel on purpose. We want it to not just be a, oh, let's see what happens, but it's a like, no, I'm going to go see a friend or I'm going to go see this monument or I'm going to go visit this mountain or there's this yearly event that happens and I'm going to attend it this time or, you know, a place that I've talked about going my entire life. Damn it. I'm, I'm making the plan now to, to make this happen and then write about it. And when you go on the trip, 
write about that and share that. Share it on social media. Send out an email to your friends and loved ones. I just had this adventure and I had all these really incredible personal experiences. Let me tell you about this. Really cool stuff. Sag moons are always here to help us dream a little bit bigger and to remember that the world is gigantic and it is our responsibility to go out and explore it and keep our mind open by keeping our understanding of the world open and large and expansive. Okay. For our lunar body work, we are adorning, awakening, activating, stimulating, or nourishing for action our lower back, our sciatic nerve family, and our thighs. So yes, your witch has said you getting that giant thigh tattoo is in fact a holy act. So they can stuff it and let's get it, let's get it tatted on. Let's go. All right. For the plant family, <laughs> plant body stuff that we're doing, we are harvesting. We are dealing with insects and pests and infestations and mites and things like that. We are weeding, we are plowing, and we are pruning. In particular, the pruning, the weeding, and the checking for pests is really important as we move into this part of the year with lower light and the temperature is shifting. You might find some mildew or some mold on your plants that needs to be addressed. Neem oil is really fantastic for a lot of stuff. N-E-E-M, neem. Um, but yeah, recognize that the weather is changing and your plants are going to be reacting accordingly. Okay. All right, that brings us to the astrology of October 9th, of which there is a bit and it is a little spicy. So to kick it off, we have Mercury in retrograde in Libra conjunct the sun at 16 degrees. That 16 degree mark is getting worked over. Um, this can manifest as a deep urge to express yourself and your thoughts in every possible way. But please remember, Mercury is in retrograde. So what you might be needing to express are things that you have been holding in from the past or things that you had previously decided that you wanted to keep secret, but are now bursting to the surface. And we want to be present with ourselves in those moments, right? Because maybe it is time for that secret thing to come out and be in the light and be known. And maybe it isn't, but we will still have the same urge and intensity to say it out loud. Um, so just know that. <laughs> Uh, on this day, your mind may be much clearer than usual. You might be feeling super alert and mentally sharp. Um, very conscious of any of your purpose in any project that you are engaged in might be feeling a lot of mental vigor on this day um but even if all of that stuff isn't true for you this could be a day where you are just exceptionally crowded with communication you are sending a million texts a million people got to get in, in touch with you and you're getting phone calls and emails and all sorts of stuff people in the hall need to stop you your neighbor wants to stop and have a five minute chat with you everybody wants to talk with you and you also want to talk with everybody just be aware that some stuff might slip out of your mouth that you had previously intended to keep to yourself just be aware okay also on this day, we have Mercury retrograde conjunct Mars in Libra at 16 degrees. So yeah, that's Mercury and the Sun and Mars all stacked up on top of each other. The boy band that nobody realized that they didn't want. Okay, so this transit can be awesome if we can handle it. So let's talk about the downside of it first. No, actually, let's talk about the let's talk about the easy part first. Then we'll talk about the hard part. The easy part of this conjunction is this. This transit can be absolutely awesome because it gives us a tremendous amount of intellectual and mental energy. So thinking power, thinking drive, right? Thinking for Mercury, drive or power for Mars, energy for Mars, thinking energy. Ton of intellectual and mental energy. You can ask your brain to pretty much brainify whatever you want to brainify, and you can do it much harder and much longer than usual. Okay, so that's the cool part of this transit. What is the hard part of the transit? The hard part is that 
you can feel like you are so on top of your shit that you totally come across as a complete blowhard to whoever it is that you're talking to, whether that's a group of people or an individual or whatever. If you take yourself and your ego too seriously on this day, you may speak and act during this transition like you're spoiling for a fight. Like you're trying to start some shit with somebody. Like it sounds like everything that you're saying is a challenge to somebody or their reality or their experiences or whatever. You might sound like you don't believe them. Um, you may, in fact, actually be really irritable on this day. So here's another transit that's like ugh, irritable, ugh, fussy. We might be super set off by trivial incidents. We might be really defensive because of this transaction, this, this uh, transit. Um, and especially so on subjects that we actually don't really care about. Weird, right? Like very troll, <laughs> like arguing on the internet for the sake of arguing on the internet type energy. And nobody has time for that. I, no one has time for that. Like we all have uh, anything else that we could be doing. napping. Literally anything would be more important than arguing on the internet about people or about things that we don't actually care about. Why? Why waste the energy to do it? This also can manifest as someone else acting defensively towards you or you being on the receiving end of those types of behaviors. So if this happens, whether you find yourself in the want, want, want position or the like, oh my God, why is this person going off on this position? What I recommend is do whatever you can to take a moment, take a step back, like, oh, I'm arguing on the internet. I've already lost. What's going on? Take a step back and think to yourself about whether you actually have something real to defend before you decide to engage in the argument or the fight. Now, if you have something to defend, I encourage you to defend it, right? If you've got something to say and it needs to get said and it's going to be uncomfortable, but we got to say this, it's got to get said. People are going to have to get over it right? But if the person that you're talking to is just tripping and going off on stuff and you don't actually have a dog in the fight, this might be a moment that you're like, this is not the mountain for me to die on. You know what? What was, what was that mean? <laughs> There's a meme out there. That's a, <laughs> this woman that's like, I don't argue with people anymore. You want to tell me one plus two equals five? You're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. It's that kind of a vibe. <laughs> like, and you want to take a moment to think like, is this something I really need to be defensive about and like stand up and speak on behalf of? Or is this just like, whatever, who cares? You guys sound like idiots and I'm not getting involved. I don't care. <laughs> so it does require us to have some integrity and really understand what we care about before we start jumping down somebody else's throat about something. <laughs> All right. That is our astrology. Is that everything? Oh, no, no, no. We got one other thing for this day. Sorry, sorry. We also have Venus and Sagittarius opposing the North Node in Gemini slash conjunct the South Node in Sagittarius at two degrees. Yes, the nodes are going to be changing signs soon. And this is one of their last interactions that they're having with the planets in Sagittarius and Gemini before they move backwards, just to keep it fun, into Taurus and Scorpio. So what happens when we have this Venus opposed North node? We are challenged to let our guard down and let others in. Isn't that wild on this day where we have all of this astrology that's like, you might be really fussy, you might be really argumentative, you might be really defensive, you might be just like crazy about getting your opinion shoved down somebody else's throat and you don't have any room for dissent and damn it, listen to me, I've got this thing to say. And here is Venus in Sagittarius oppose the North Node that's like, you need to relax and just open up, man. <laughs> Just, just hang out and just like let your guard down and just like let folks just like hang out and be with you. Like, what's the problem? So in all of this, like, I'm mad, I'm frustrated, I'm defensive. There's also th this Venusian energy that has just walked into Sagittarius. That's like, can't we be more expansive and generous with our behavior here? So you may find that you like start the day with an argument and then at lunch, you're like, I'm really sorry about that. And by the end of the day, the person is coming back to you and like, no, I'm not okay with this. I need to continue to argue about this <laughs> because what else are we going to do with our time? Right. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to the holy days of October 9th. 
holy days for October 9th, starting off with uh, the Feast of Goddesses of Wisdom, running from October 9th to October 11th. This is a modern pagan holiday, um, also recognized by modern Gnostics, or some Gnostic groups, I guess I should say. As we talked about on other episodes of the podcast, the Wheel of the Year is something that has become really popular with a lot of pagans, Wiccans, witches, heathens, um, and other polytheists around the planet over the last 20 years or so. And there have been a wide variety of books written and websites created that have really extensive um, calendars to them. And some of the dates are accurate and some of them are not. And in some cases, modern pagans have invented holidays that are approximately at the right time of year for celebrating that archetype or that deity or that collection of deities. And so, in my opinion, that's what this holiday is, because there certainly isn't anything that goes into the past that would celebrate all of these holidays, these goddesses all at the same time, or deities all at the same time. So this is the feast of goddesses slash deities of wisdom for modern pagans, AKA, if you don't remember any of the other dates that I've mentioned <laughs> at this time of year, you can celebrate these ideas on these days. So this is celebrating goddess or God as the source of all knowledge. And so we honor gods and goddesses like Odin and Frigg from uh, the Norse pantheon, Sophia from Christian and Greek, uh, Ma'at from the Egyptians, Metis from the Greeks, Saraswati from Hindu, and Manat um, from our Arabic Sufi, Sufi friends. Just a very short, short, short list of the various wisdom deities that we might tap into. Thoth would be another one that we could certainly put on that list. All right. Also on this day from our Roman answers, ancestors, we have Iunium Sereris. And this is a fast for Ceres in preparation for a holiday that takes place tomorrow, October 10th, called the Mundus series. We'll get into it in just a second. Uh, also on this day, we have a feast to the Saint Dionysius from our Catholic friends, who is, hello, it's Dionysus. Like, come on, stop, stop it. Stop it with the whole, it's stop, it's Dionysus, okay? We just had multiple holidays for Dionysus and for Bacchus, and now we have the feast of Saint Dionysus who I'm sure is totally unrelated, even though he has exactly the same name. Okay. Uh, in the early 6th century, this is the funny thing that I discovered reading about this saint. In the early 6th century, a series of writings of a mystical nature employing Neoplatonic language to elucidate Christian theology and mystical ideas was ascribed to St. Dionysius. They no longer are recognized as writings from him. The, basically, the priests at the time were like, absolutely not. And so they say that it is pseudo-Dionysus who wrote it. It's not the. It's not St. Dionysus. No, no. It's far too pagan. It must have been a fake. All right, let's move on to October 10th. <laughs> October 10th. Our moon is still in Sagittarius, so we are still doing Sagittarius moon stuff. Okay. Also on this day, for astrology, we have another super casual, not at all a big deal moment. Everybody just calm down. I wasn't even going to mention it. Just like the Pluto thing. It's just whatever, whatever. Saturn is stationing direct at 6 degrees of Aquarius at 7.17 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Yeah. These two planets, Pluto and Saturn, both stationing direct in the same week, because it's 2021. So sure, set everything on fire, right? <laughs> ah! Ah! Okay. <laughs> it's fine. Like I said, it's fine. Everybody's fine. Calm down. Please calm down. It's fine. When Saturn stations direct. Okay, what's up with that? Saturn has been retrograde since sometime in May. And has been, you know, retrograde basically for these last five-ish, five, almost six months. Um... And uh, maybe it's a little bit less than that, but whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is Saturn is stationing direct. Um, so changing directions, heading back forward again. So what are the types of things that we can expect when Saturn is stationing direct? Well, you want to watch out for things like plans to fall apart or to suddenly radically change. 
Um, cheating on a diet. Not a big fan of a diet, but I understand that diets can be really helpful for our health, not not about losing weight. But whatever that is for you, right? I've been abstaining from this thing and I'm breaking my own rules on a day like this. Um we might be falling off the wagon again, whatever that means for you, right? I've been abstaining from a thing and now I'm quote unquote falling to the temptation of it, or I'm losing my structures and my boundaries that I created around this. Um, we might find that a supportive or an authoritative person is suddenly gone from our life. They may suddenly disappear and we may not know why. So we don't want to turn them into a monster, right? We don't want to turn that into a, they're doing this to me. They may, we don't know. We don't know why, but they are suddenly gone. There might also be control issues that come up on a day like this and alienating behavior. We might engage in it. We might be subjected to it. It's a lot of that stuff. Saturn is about kind of the big no. And my nickname for Santa or for, <laughs> for Santa, yes, <laughs> there is a connection there, but we won't talk about it until Yule, <laughs> but don't look behind the curtain. Um, but my, my name for Saturn is angry grandpa. <laughs> um, wise has been around the block a couple times and has no time for your foolishness. So this could be a day that really feels like a big no from the universe. If nothing else of this, you know, specific manifests for you. Um, it could be a day that just feels very, very slow. Saturn represents a lot of the processes in our life that are very slow, that take their time. And so everything on this day might feel like it has just slowed down. Um, and you can't get anywhere. You can't make any progress with the thing. But because Saturn is stationing direct, every day is going to feel like more progress is made and even more progress and even more progress as Saturn slowly picks up speed and starts to head back in the right direction at its normal pace. That's our astrology for this day. So let me now talk about the holy days. All right, on October 10th, we have the heliacal rising of the fixed star Saginus. Uh, we find this star in the left shoulder of the constellation Boots or Booties. Um, but let's focus on the word Saginus. This is a word coming to us from Latin for, wait for it, corn crop, come on, and thus meaning a harvester or a reaper. In fact, in some illustrations of this constellation, we see the character holding a reaping sickle in their hand. However, um, to the Arabs, this star is called Al-Haris, and that means the guard or the protector. Um, and so here we have that guard or protection energy coming through again, and we're going to see even more of it as we get closer and closer to Samhain. Also on this day, from October 10th to October 16th, we have Amaratat from our Zoroastrian friends. Amardad is the Avestan language name of the Zoroastrian divinity or divine concept of immortality. Amardad is the Amesha Spenta or the spirit of a long life on earth and perpetuality in the afterlife. The word Amaratat is grammatically feminine and the divinity Amardad is a divine entity. Etymologically, Avestan Amardat derives from an Indo-Iranian root and is linguistically related to the Vedic Sanskrit Amrita, uh, which is very important. <laughs> and so, um, you know, Amrita is this idea of immortality, but it's also this idea of sweetness. Um, and so this, this entity, this holiday is celebrating this entity that is sort of the sweetness of, of immortality and the sweetness of life. And just to bring it back around to the Western world, hi, candy is kind of a big deal at Halloween, isn't it? Well, that's an interesting combination <laughs> slash kawinka dinka. Huh, okay. Also on this day, <laughs> we have the Feast of the Archangel Uriel from Celtic Brittany. 
Um, there are multiple feast days for the Archangel Uriel. And as well, we just talked about last week how um, modern Catholics have lumped all of the archangels and angels in general into Michael Mass, basically. There's just one day that's the day that all of those um, angels are celebrated. But in other groups, it's still broken up into the various days. Uh, the Archangel Uriel is the Archangel of, well, what exactly do they do? <laughs> they're, the, they're the God of light, or the Archangel of light. Uriel is basically means God is my light. Um, they are depicted with a fire in their hand, carrying a book, a scroll, and a flaming sword, a disc of the sun, and a celestial orb or disc of stars and constellations. So that would also imply that this is a deity that has something to do with time and the, the turning of seasons. Um, in Ethiopian or excuse me, in the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition, they are depicted holding a chalice as well, which is pretty cool. Um, where a fourth archangel is added to the named three to represent the four cardinal points, Uriel is generally the one that's picked for that. However, the Book of Enoch clearly distinguishes between Uriel and Uriel, and Uriel means the god of God is my light. Okay, moving on to this gigantic holiday. Uh, the, which is the opening of the Mundus Sereris. So this is called Mundus Patet, and this is the second time in our calendar year that this uh, is taking place. This is from our Roman ancestors. The Mundus Serialis literally means the world of Ceres was a hemispherical pit or underground vault in Rome. We've talked about this holiday before or talked about this pit before. It literally was like a dish in the earth with a domed lid. So it was as if it was its own world. Um, it was usually sealed by a stone lid known as the lapis manalis. The lapis manalis, Latin, Stone of the Manes. Hello, we just had Mania a couple of days ago dedicated to the Manes and the Lairs and all those cats. Was either of two sacred stones used in the Roman religion. One covered a gate to Hades, the abode of the dead. Um, Festus called it Ostium Orci, or the Gate of Orcus. And then we have the Lapis Manalis, which was the lid on the world of Ceres. In ancient Roman religion, the Manes we just talked about a little bit ago, or demanes, are Chthonic deities sometimes thought to represent the souls of deceased loved ones. They were associated with the Lairs and the Lemurs and the Genii and the Penates um, and pertained to domestic and local and personal cults. They belonged broadly to the category of di inferi, those who dwell below, um, the undifferentiated collective of the divine dead. The mains were honored during Parentalia and Feralia in February, which we talked about at the beginning of the year. And so three times a year, this pit gets opened. August 24th, we talked about just a little bit ago, today, and then uh, in October, or excuse me, in November. And it was opened with the official announcement, Mundus Patet, the Mundus is open. And offerings were made there to agricultural and or underworld deities, including Ceres as a goddess of the fruitful earth and guardian of its underworld portals. Its opening offered the spirits of the dead temporary leave from the underworld to roam lawfully amongst the living in what one author describes as holidays, so to speak, for the ghosts. And we're certainly in that time of year, so it completely makes sense that they were doing that. Uh, the days when the Mundus was open were among the very few occasions that Romans made official contact with the collective spirits of the dead, the demanes or demains, the others being, as we said, Parentalia and Lemuralia, which we talk about in February during Imbolc season. So here we have this really interesting situation going on with this with this holiday where this pit is being opened up. Um, this absolutely connects us to um, the Eleusinian mysteries and all of the stuff that is happening with uh, the temple or the, 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 the sacrifices that are happening before, during and after that whole mystery series. And even though that's Greek, in my opinion, this is sort of what was left over for the Romans in terms of what they could understand had been left 
um, after, you know, pillaging, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, lapis, by the way, of course, is a blue stone um, that is threaded with silver and gold and often looks like a starry night. And so I wonder if the lapis manalis literally was made of lapis to look like a sky so that if you were in the pit looking up, you would literally see this starry sky overhead that was actually this stone. Um, who knows though, but pretty cool stuff there. Pretty cool connections, pretty cool stuff. All right, let's move on to October 11th. All right, folks, this brings us to October 11th. This is the last day of our lunar week. And we wrap it up with a waxing crescent moon in Capricorn. This moon is for challenging ourselves to attempt the impossible or at the very least something daunting or difficult. It is extremely useful to try something that you have avoided specifically because that you were told that you or people like you would just never be able to handle this sort of thing, right? Yeah, that stuff. Not just any old challenge. One of those challenges that's been out there like poking at you, like people like you never get involved in stuff like this because it's too hard. It's too difficult. That thing. This is... um this is a challenge, though, that whatever you do, you've got to do it without help. you got to take it on yourself. Um, this is a moon for lone accomplishment, solo accomplishment. Attempted for the mastery experience or to achieve the goal. Don't rely on luck. Plan and prepare. Train and attack is what... Raven Caldera recommends in Moon Phase Astrology. <laughs> Make a strategic plan um, and act like this is something that you have to do. Not like, oh, I have to do it, but like my survival depends on knowing how to do this. I have to accomplish this. I can't afford to lose this battle. I must win. I approach it from that attitude. And if you fail which is totally okay and, you know, let's be honest, probably expected from a person like you. <laughs> Prepare again. Figure out what you got wrong. Get it right and do it again. And do it again if you need to until you achieve success. That's what's up with this moon. Push yourself to tackle one of those scary goals out there. Do it. Okay. Okay. For our lunar body work with our waxing crescent moon in Capricorn, we are activating, awakening, adorning, and stimulating and nourishing for action our skin, our bones, our hair, and our nails, especially our skeletal structure. So if there's some kind of support that you can give yourself, boost up on the calcium, if nothing else. Um, but anything that we can do for our skin, our nails, our teeth, our bones, our hair, all of that stuff. Okay. For our plant body work, we are building or fixing structures inside or outside. We're looking at the practicality of where our plants are living and looking to see, does anything need to be fixed, repaired? Do I need to build something to support my plants? Perhaps today is the day to install a trellis for my vining plant that's going out of control or whatever it is. All right. That's everything that we have for Lunar. We have no astro on this day. Hooray! Because we got plenty of it this week. <laughs> so let's get on with the holy days of October 11th. All right. From October 11th through the 15th, we have Durga Puja from our Hindu friends and neighbors and relatives. Um, the first depictions of Durga may have been found in the Indus Valley approximately 5,000 years ago. So this is, a, this is a goddess who has been around for a little while. Okay. Uh, she is a major deity in Hinduism. She is worshipped as a principal aspect of the mother goddess Devi. 
and is one of the most popular and widely revered amongst Indian divinities. She is associated with protection, strength, motherhood, destruction, and war. Her legend centers around combating evil and demonic forces that threaten peace or prosperity and dharma, the power of good over evil. Durga is believed to unleash her divine wrath against the wicked for the liberation of the oppressed and entails destruction to empower creation. The word Durga literally means impassable, invincible, unassailable. In Hindu arts, this um, uh, she is usually depicted as very tranquil in her face. She's very peaceful. She's surrounded by weapons. She's killing demons. She's going ham, as the kids say. But she's totally placid in her face. And the traditional belief around that is because she is protective and violent, not because of hatred or egotism, or getting pleasure from violence, but because she acts out of necessity, for the love of the good, for liberation of those who would depend on her, and as a mark of the beginning of the soul's journey to creative freedom. Think about all of that stuff with all of that astrology that we have going on this week with all of the moon work that we have of like digging in and getting into some spooky, spooky shit. Here's Durga coming along right at the last of it and saying, but this is all for the good of humanity. But this is all for the good of you and your own personal liberation. Let go of your fears. Let go of the things that are holding you back within yourself. And also, let's call out the system and st systemic abuses that are holding us all back. Those are just as evil, if not more so, than the fears that I have within myself. Evil, quote unquote. Bad, right? Hard. So this is really the heart of Navratri. And so the rituals of Durga Puja last 10 days, <clears throat> but the last five are a really big deal. Um... And this is where she is venerated and people put up giant displays around their houses and things like that. Um, her weapons are worshipped. Uh, on another day, the victory of Durga over the evil buffalo demon is celebrated, etc., etc. So um, every day is sort of celebrating another piece of that story or that myth around her victory over evil. Um, Durga is an incredible goddess. I could talk about her for hours. We don't have the scope here in the, in the old podcast. Um, so you, if you want a place to start, her Wikipedia page is fantastic and it has a million different links to a bunch of other places. Um, and that is literally just the place to start. That is not the place where I would end <laughs> reading about Durga. Durga is incredible. Ma Durga. Ma Durga. All right. Also on this day from October 11th to October 15th, approximately from our Shinto friends, we have Raitai Sai, which means grand festival. This is the Shuuki Raitai Sai. Um, and it is the autumn grand festival of the shrine. And in my research, I found out that it isn't just between October 11th and 13th, the various regions um, around the various what are the prefects territories around Japan um, all celebrate at different times. So, but throughout October, very much like the other fall festivals that we talked about in uh, throughout Asia, there isn't necessarily one locked day or weekend. Um, it really is about the weather and as the leaves are turning in those various regions. All right. Also on this day, we have coming out day this is a global holiday it's also a national holiday but it's also a global holiday this is annual lgbtqia plus alphabet mafia awareness day observed on october 11th to support lesbian gay bisexual transgender ace arrow uh non-binary uh and everybody else um <laughs> 
Um, this is our queer community. We are celebrating us coming out of the closet. First celebrated in the United States in 1988, the initial idea was grounded in the feminist and gay liberation spirit of the personal being political and the emphasis on the most basic form of activism being coming out to our friends, our family, and our colleagues, and living life as openly homos. Homos, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. All right, sorry. Uh, the foundational belief is that homophobia thrives in an atmosphere of silence and ignorance, and that once people know that they have loved ones who are lesbian or gay, they are far less likely to be assholes. It's true. Or at least they're far less likely to do it in your face. Okay, also on this day, <laughs> we have Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is a holiday that is specific to the Americas. Um, this is a holiday that celebrates and honors Native American peoples and commemorates their histories and their cultures. It is celebrated across the United States on the second Monday in October. It is officially a city and state holiday in a variety of locations. It began as a counter celebration held on the same day as the U.S. federal holiday, Columbus Day, <laughs> uh, which honors the Italian tyrant, Christopher Columbus. It says explorer here. I don't know why. Uh, many reject celebrating him. Hello. Uh, saying that he represents the violent history of the colonization of the Western Hemisphere. I would agree. And that Columbus Day is a sanitization or covering up of a Columbus Columbus's re uh, actions, such as enslaving Native Americans. I would agree. It was instituted in Berkeley, California in 1992 um, and has been sort of embraced across the country since then. Um, hooray to that, right? Screw Columbus. Get that asshole out of here. Up, up with the people. Also, how about a little bit of land back? That'd be a nice day to have that conversation, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That is our Lunar Week. Let me give you the roundup and let me let you go. Okay, friends. So to wrap it up. Um, our lunar phases this week move from Libra into Capricorn, and both of those are cardinal signs. So we are still initiating uh, the new season, right? And as we said at the beginning, this is our first new moon, not just in Maybon season, but also in fall, like the whole season of fall. This is our first new moon. So we really are just stepping in to this season and kind of saying, hello, what all is, what is this all going to be about? Okay. Our astrology for this week, we have on October 6th, Pluto stationing direct in Capricorn at 24 degrees. On October 7th, we have Venus moving into Sagittarius. We have the Sun conjunct Mars in Libra at 15 degrees. Um... What else have we got? Let's see. October 9th, we have Mercury in Libra conjunct the sun at 16 degrees. And we also have Mercury conjunct Mars in Libra at 16 degrees. And then on the 10th of October, we have Saturn stationing direct at six degrees of Aquarius. Next week, we have the sun trining Jupiter, and then we have Jupiter stationing direct. OM jeepers, guys. Kind of a cool thing. Let me give you a heads up on that, even though we've got all of this week to get through before we get to that week. For me personally, days when Jupiter stations direct, now I'm a Sagittarius, Jupiter is my ruling planet, that aside, I have found these to be exceptionally lucky days. Like lucky to the point of I might even like buy a lottery ticket or something along those lines on that day. It's just something. I don't know what it is, but there's something about Jupiter stationing direct that all of that good luck and those good vibes and that expansive attitude of the planet is like, yes, let's go forward and do the thing. I have found four leaf clovers legitimately on the day that Jupiter turns direct. So maybe some of that luck will be happening for you. In fact, since you're listening, let me give you the heads up. It is on 
what day? Where is it? I know you're here. I'm looking for you. There it is. October 17th or October 18th, depending on where you are on the planet. So, you know, just something to think about. Something to consider. Okay. Um, next class that's coming up is going to be Wheel of the Year for Samhain, the six-week guide to Witches New Year. And that is going to be on October something. What day am I teaching that? Probably the 21st. Probably the 21st, right after the full moon. Um, but we'll see because time is weird right now for me. <laughs> Lots of things are weird right now for me. Uh, so I may teach it a little bit closer to the actual holiday itself. You'll hear about it here first or second. You can always sign up to my newsletter to get even more information. And if you would like to support this podcast and support me and the many, many hours that I put into doing this, <laughs> as well as support me creating the classes, uh, which I teach on YouTube for free. Um, please sign up to my Patreon if you are financially flush and that is viable for your life and lifestyle. Please sign up to my Patreon and support me doing this work. I appreciate you. All right. Uh, be chill this week, my kids. TLDR, just keep your damn mouth shut. That's probably the very best way to get through all of this. Just be quiet. <laughs> all right, my loves. Blessed be. Good luck out there.